Okay, well, it's it's about 101, so I think we can go ahead and get started since we have so much to do in the next 90 minutes. So welcome everyone. It's great to see you all and thanks so much for being here for our spring 2021 research talks. I'm Rebecca Cummings, the Digital Matters Librarian, and I'll be introducing our speakers for today and moderating Q&A. Now, before we start the research talks, I'm going to start this event with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationships between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Now to our fabulous slate of speakers for today. I'm going to briefly introduce all six of them now so that we can go straight from presentation to presentation. Our first speaker today is going to be Sarah Sinwell, who is a Digital Matters faculty grantee and assistant professor in film and media arts. Second, we'll hear from Ashley Cordes, a Digital Matters faculty grantee and assistant professor in the Department of Communication. Our third speaker is Jacqueline Wright, a Digital Matters exhibition and performance faculty grantee and assistant professor of photography and digital imaging. After our faculty grantees, we're going to hear from our Digital Matters graduate student fellows, starting with John Flynn, who is a joint Digital Matters American West Center graduate student fellow and a PhD candidate in the Department of History. Our fifth speaker is Daniel Uncaffer, a Digital Matters graduate student fellow and PhD student in creative writing. And last but not least, we're going to hear from Danielle Waters, who is our Digital Matters exhibition and performance graduate student grantee and is currently finishing her master's in arts and teaching fine arts. Since we have six speakers today, I do ask that each presenter limit their time to 10 minutes and for the audience to reserve your questions until the end of the talks. So with that, I am now going to turn the mic over to Dr. Sarah Sinwell. Hi, all. Give me one moment while I share my screen. Can everyone see that? Great. OK, so thanks for coming. So many people, so exciting that all of you are so interested today. I want to start by thanking the people at Digital Matters for giving me this grant and allowing me to present on ELSA multiple times. So hopefully this is going to be new for those of you who've heard me talk about ELSA before today, because I've done a lot of work since I last gave a talk. And I also want to thank my graduate research assistant, Mitch Gardner, who helped me gather some of these materials, create the slideshow, create some of the imagery you're gonna to see today. So the title of my talk today is Representation Matters, Mapping Gender, Race, and Sexuality on Twitter. And you can see the image here of Elsa's profile was created by Mitch as an image I'm hoping to use as part of a future, my second book project, possibly also a digital companion to my second book. And what this kind of imagery shows, and I'll talk about this throughout the presentation today, is some of the tweets for Give Elsa a Girlfriend, which is one of the tweets I'm studying in the process of writing this book. So I want to provide you with a little background to start. So this is my second book project, and it focuses on how audience and fans of blockbuster films and franchises such as Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Black Panther, and Frozen use Twitter hashtags to create a space for alternative forms of representation in popular media. And I'm especially interested in mapping the intersections between gender, race, and sexuality on Twitter. Thus, I've chosen a number of these of these projects as part of this as part of this presentation today but i'll be focusing on elsa and frozen just for today's presentation oh somehow okay so some of the other hashtag campaigns that i'm looking at are representation matters which is a larger campaign to think about forms of representation in the media we need lgbtq stories give elsa a girlfriend from frozen let iu have a girlfriend from black panther Make Ray Asexual from Star Wars The Force Awakens, Keep Jughead Asexual from Riverdale, and then recast Batwoman, which was a campaign to recast Ruby Rose and Batwoman, who of course since has left not only Twitter, but also left um, Batwoman. So here are my research questions for what I'll be discussing today. 
How can gendered race and sexualized identities be articulated on Twitter? What is the scale and geographic spread of the relevant Twitter hashtags? What kinds of languages are used in these campaigns? How do fans and anti-fans use hashtags to create a space for their own identities? And here, this is one of the questions that's come up as I've been working on this project for the last few years, is I've been told I have to answer the question of what do we do with the haters? So today I'm talking about Elso and no haters, but it, within the larger project, I will be talking about anti-fans and especially how those anti-fans reinforce whiteness and heteronormativity in campaigns such as Recast Batwoman and Not My Ariel. And then this other question of how does hashtag activism and draw attention to the need for more representation of marginalized communities within popular media such as Marvel and Disney. So here's my larger argument and then I'll be discussing how this fits into the ELSA campaign. So my larger argument talks about the ways in which these Twitter campaigns position marginalized identities in an in-between space that's constantly vacillating between its hyper-awareness of racial and sexual difference and its erasure. And again, this is one of the questions that I'm getting at by the campaigns that I've chosen is most of the campaigns I've chosen are drawing attention to the need to represent race, gender, and sexuality on screen, but some of them are also erasing that representation. So this pushes up against the whiteness and heteronormativity of corporate sponsored media culture. It draws attention to the absence of people of color and LGBTQ characters within contemporary media and creates alternative possibilities for more inclusive media representation and visibility. And as I've looked at these campaigns, I've definitely seen the ways in which people who are posting on Twitter are really asking for corporations like Marvel and Disney, and especially corporations that address the issues of children's media, that they ask for more inclusive media representation and visibility, and also how this creates community across disparate geographies and transnational locations, and we'll talk more about that today as well. So I wanted to give you a little background before I go into what I've been working on this semester. So in summer 2020, I attended the NEH workshop, Understanding Digital Culture, Humanist Lenses for Internet Research. And I did some coding as part of this, as I've never done any coding. I've been working on this project since I believe 2019, and I hadn't done coding when I started the project, but now as a result of attending this workshop and as I'm working through um, this project this semester, I've been learning how to code. And so I compiled data for the hashtags give Elsa a girlfriend and the I have a girlfriend using Anaconda and Jupiter. And then I worked on visualizing this data using coding and digital humanities tools like Orange and Gephe. So my essay on make Ray asexual and keep Jughead asexual has already come out in feminist and queer theory and intersectional transnational reader, but I'm planning on expanding it since I didn't have these coding abilities nor the ability to visualize this data when I wrote that piece. And then my essay on Black Panther, Let Ayo Have a Girlfriend Resisting Black Lesbian Erasure on Twitter will be published this year in Black Panther, Afrofuturism, Gender, Black uh, Identity and the Remaking of Blackness. And again, I didn't have this um, ability to code when I wrote that piece either, but that's something that I'm looking forward to exploring more in this project is how does it expand on my arguments if I have the ability to visualize some of this data and code it accordingly. So that's what I've started doing this semester with the grant from Digital Matters. So here's the graphic again that Mitch, my research assistant, was able to create for me in consultation. So as a result of that 2020 um, workshop, I compiled over 8,000 tweets of the hashtag Give Elsa a Girlfriend from April 30th, 2016, when the hashtag was created to one week later. And this was suggested to me by NEH, the people who ran the NEH workshop, that you wanna limit your data so it's not millions of tweets. So they suggested getting between 2,000 and 10,000 tweets. So for that one week, I got 8,000 tweets. And I've analyzed those tweets accordingly, both pre my ability to put them in an Excel spreadsheet and now. And these are some of the most popular ones um, in the graphic here. So as you see, you can see the desire to trend, give us a girlfriend. You have people on Twitter saying, dear at Disney, speaking directly to Disney itself. They're talking about how all love deserves to be represented, how sexuality is valid, how we need this in kids' movies, how it leads to acceptance, and all of these kind of modes of thinking about this. So this is one of the images I'm hoping to use 
in the future project, either for, you know, within the book or as part of my digital companion, really thinking through these ideas of how we can represent sexuality in relationship to these Twitter campaigns. The other thing we did was look at a few other websites that gather data from Twitter. One is talkwalker.com, socialalert.com, and hashtagify. And these, um, these websites, again, are designed to visualize data. And we, we came into some kind of interesting issues with these. So I'm going to discuss that in a moment. And then I'll discuss some of the other um, visualizations that we came up with as part of this project. So this was one of the things that we were hoping to design. This is not the actual image that explains Give Elsa a Girlfriend, but this is one of the images we were hoping to design as part of this process, to gather data, to talk about all the different languages that have been used as part of the Give Elsa a Girlfriend hashtag. But what we discovered is that the, the for example, hashtagify, which we spoke directly to them, that they do not gather data as far uh, back as 2016, they only can gather data from the past week. So this was kind of a stopping point for us because we, we, I wanted to gather the same data that I gathered through the Excel spreadsheet from that week right after the hashtag started in 2016. So the concept here is we would think through all the languages that are being used as part of this hashtag and then create this kind of digital map as you see here. But now we're going to have to rethink how to do that and in terms of gathering that data from 2016. The other um, image that we were able to do using hashtag is this one with all the related hashtags. So after looking through those 8,000 tweets, I found some of the most popular additional hashtags that are being used in addition to give Elsa a girlfriend. And then Mitch was able to put them into this beautiful um, data visualization. And what you can see here is here are the other hashtags I was interested in. Um, the darker the tone is the ones I was more interested in. And then the bigger the square or the box, the more it was being used. So I think this is also an interesting conversation that terms like LGBTQ, lesbian and gay are used the most, followed by queer, representation matters. And then the issue of tolerance, inclusivity and homophobia also come up as part of that process. So again, thinking through how all these hashtags work in relationship to each other is also part of my further project. So the last thing I want to talk about are what are my next steps? And this is a, I think I should have mentioned at the beginning, this is an ongoing process. I expect it to take a few years to cont continue to complete this book project. So my next steps are to find additional help from a data analyst or an engineer to help me, again, visualize this data, possibly contact Twitter about collecting data from 2016 during the campaign's lifetime. And I think some of you might be interested to know this if you're working on Twitter data. I did contact IRB and they told me that if the data is public, you do not need to get IRB permission or go through that process. So that might be good to know for other people that the process of IRB is not something you need to do as long as that data is public. I'm not sure what happens if for some reason I were able to pay for that Twitter data or find it from somewhere else. So that my, the rest of my project is continuing to do research and creating more of these graphics to help analyze these campaigns. And ideally, I'd like to make one for each one of those hashtag campaigns I mentioned earlier. So I really look forward to hearing any of your thoughts on this. Thank you so much again for listening. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you in the Q&A. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. Ashley, are you able to access the share screen button? I believe so. All good? Good. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Cordes and a citizen of the Coquel Nation. And the DM project that I'm going to be sharing with you today is titled Indigenous Cryptocurrency, Finance, Capital, and the Digital Ghosts of Empire. So my primary focus this term was to really work with some of the more out there ideas that I had had about Indigenous cryptocurrency, but needed more of the full creative freedom and community and resources that this uh, grant actually afforded. So I'll share some of my progress thus far in applying Indigenous digital methodologies and engaging with a new theoretical terrain that fuses cryptocurrency with these larger ideas of Indigenous technological afterlife, as well as ethereality. And I want to thank my RA, Micah Huff, for assisting me with this project. 
So first to back up, I'm assuming that most people know what cryptocurrency is, especially in this crowd. But the gist is that um, they're digital peer to peer currencies or assets that are enabled via computer software and secured using cryptography. And blockchain specifically refers to the electronic record keeping system that stores that data. And blockchain technology is generative because it's able to kind of decentralize control and perhaps increase trust in a system. So cryptocurrencies are being considered in indigenous nations to potentially become less reliant on the US dollar and to honor their own financial philosophies rather than those that were just prescribed by settler colonial governments. So there have been a few that have come out, one that's called Maza Coin, and it came out around 2014 to serve the greater Lakota nation to resist colonialism. But ultimately, it had a pretty complicated story with media and had some problems baked into its underlying code. And OYX, which is another one that has gotten media attention lately, and due to COVID travel restrictions, I of course only um, have textual secondary uh, knowledge of it because I wasn't able to travel. But it's really being framed as this, you know, resistance to Bolsonaro's government, particularly uh, in Amazonia and indigenous people there who have suffered from COVID-19 and are not getting aid from that, as well as environmental threats like deforestation. And there are other indigenous coins out there as well. Now, cryptocurrencies, underlying technologies have roots in prior indigenous technologies, that's for sure. And those are millennia old. So for example, hashing, which is this conversion of data into um, a unique string of text is really just the story of blockchain translated with numbers that actually build over time. So this is comparable to the picture on the right, which is a rye. And that's huge limestone disks that are used by Yapis people to hold various forms of, of value. And as more transactions occur, the story kind of grows. And with blockchain, it really generally requires a large community and has um, aspects of reciprocity and compensation built into the system that can, if done correctly, start to demonstrate aspects of community care. And blockchains like Ethereum, um, they allow users not just to mark transactions per se, but also use contracts and processes within them. So that means that many aspects um, or elements of blockchains are polymorphic in nature. So they build as simultaneously these transactions, these contracts and these processes. And there are a number of indigenous um, technologies that do similar things. So for example, on the left, I have wampum, which was used um, in many different ways as belts, as currencies, as treaties, as forms of identification, as histories, and sometimes all at once in this polymorphic fashion. So these are important because indigenous digitality really honors prior forms of innovation. And rather than see them as this kind of linear line of past, present, future, it sees them kind of as spirals on a different kind of continuum. So to dig deeper, uh, I used a few methodologies. The most important one was a digital listening circle where I interviewed indigenous cryptocurrency experts, uh, mixed media artists, elders, computer scientists to kind of get to the core of what um, its underlying technologies are, its connections to past uh, traditions, its problematics and its potential use cases. And I also used a method of deep speculative imagining. And so that's something that's used a lot in indigenous futurisms research. And it's a way for us to look at technology, not from this kind of naive techno optimist perspective, but using indigenous digitality. And so this is informed by indigenous thinkers like Grace Dillon and Jason Lewis, who are, who are really wonderful. Um, and in terms of theories of technological afterlife, it was useful for me to draw on conceptions of ghosts, of haunting, of apocalypse, and I'll share just a few of those right now. So the first finding regards ghosts and how they have this specific politic in the settler colonial world of haunting. So they have this um, haunting that ranges from terror or revenge or processes of 
restoration, but indigenous scholars, and I quote Tuck and Ree suggest that haunting is the relentless remembering and reminding that we will not be appeased by settler society's assurances of innocence and reconciliation. So I do think that indigenous crypto has been really tuned into this. So Maza coin, for example, speaks back through its code to the US's illegal seizure of the Black Hills, which were a spiritual land for the Lakota people and their creationist stories. And they baked that into the Genesis blockchain through a message. And also you can see on the left top, there are these multimedia branding elements of Maza coin where they had these kind of ghostly or spiritual indexes of really important past indigenous leaders who actually are there to kind of haunt settler histories that um, want us to forget that those treaties actually existed. So it kind of takes some excavation to find those. And for OYX, um, it's not a traditional crypto per se, but more of this donation tool. So it's tracked using blockchain. And this can perhaps reflect some of the spirits of gifting economies that exist. And at least it was said to be um, constructed to fight back issues like deforestation and climate change that are of course the ghosts of settler colonial praxis. I also engage with this concept of zombie media, which um, means media that have failed or are considered dead, but they kind of linger, linger in their um, ecosystem, even in their assumed obsolescence. So we could think of something like a cassette tape. But in terms of crypto, Maza and other indigenous currencies might be considered zombie media because they didn't do a particularly great job of bootstrapping widespread interest. So they had problems in their proof of work system, didn't have enough vendors to accept the coin, and were based on Zeta coin, which is a relatively unknown or unpopular coin. So there are problems there. And it's not that we shouldn't, I don't think, I think we actually should still study coins that are considered failed because they really are important to this history of, of innovation themselves. And there are actually like thousands of altcoins out there. And many of them are zombified and they really only digitally kind of reanimate when Bitcoin kind of dramatically increases in value like it did this year. So I'd like to share a quote from my friend uh, and Oglala uh, scholar, Suzanne Kite. She says, a physical computing device created in a good way must be designed with the right to repair as well as recycle, transform and reuse. The creator of any object is responsible for the ex uh, effects of its creation, use and in its afterlife. So to me, indigenous thinkers have been really brilliant about telling us how we need to be building our software in more ethical ways from the ground up. And with this preparation for either a right to repair or a death cycle, because if zombie media like Maza exists, they could be causing various environmental harms by the immense amount of energy that's used in the proof of work system for mining. There's also this connection with respect to apocalypse and futurity. And indigenous peoples have largely kind of acknowledged that we've already experienced this profound apocalypse with the genocide of our peoples for the onset you know, uh, of the past uh, few centuries and with the mass extinction of plant and animal life. And this of course you know, coincides with the onset of settler capitalism and entrepreneurial terror. So, I think if alt currency like cryptocurrency does signal the capital E and D end of the traditional banking system, then we need to kind of understand that this destruction of course will continue in digital context if actions aren't actually being taken. So this includes of course that environmental harm that comes from the immense energy that blockchain uses. And that's not to say that brick and mortar systems and the transportation that it uses don't cause harms too, but it's something that we need to think about a little bit more closely. And now there are a number of indigenous generative uses for blockchain because remember indigenous peoples have really always used currency in multiple ways and polymorphic ways. So I've been working through a list that we can perhaps share in the discussion later, but 
of course, can be used for cryptocurrency, art, NFTs, tracing genomics, pairing with AI. But it's really kind of left me this with this wondering if, if blockchain could be like had this potential in the ghostly and the you know generative sense of the word of immutable of recording of kind of not letting settlers forget into kind of building a different kind of future. So regardless of what um, blockchain projects are actually taken up, I think we do need to be paying a lot more attention um, to sustainability and relationality. And those are important and, can, and basically inform future design, can learn lessons from zombie media and can kind of foster those better connections between humans, digital non-humans and the environment. So I'm glad I still have a bit of time left in the fellowship to kind of play with those ideas more and get into those dynamics. But for now, thank you for listening and looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Great. Thank you so much. Jacqueline, please let me know if you have any problems. Sure. Hi, y'all. Let me just share my screen. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, so I want to start by providing some context for the development of my new work, which I'm going to um, get to sort of towards the end of this um, 10 minutes. Um, and uh, really sort of talk about um, the work that sort of fueled the beginning of this project that is being supported um, through the Digital Matters Grant. Um, so the new work is an extension of a larger body of work um, called or titled Marked. Um, so I'd like to read a short excerpt from um, my statement on Mark just to provide that context for y'all. Mark combines traditional photographic techniques with contemporary digital processes, performance, and installation. The title refers to a prominent birthmark on my neck, which has drawn verbal and physical abuse from strangers. Reproductions of the birthmark's shape and color appear throughout the work. In Marked, I consider ways we are marked from birth, specifically through gender. Birthmarks are like political boundaries on a map, expressing the desire to include and exclude, to mark belonging through exclusion and differentiation. The work explores the parallels between patriarchal attempts to subjugate and exploit the land and the body. The work in Mark uh, took a pretty dramatic shift when I uh, accepted my position here at the U um, and moved from Salt Lake or from Chicago to Salt Lake. Um, Utah, as you might imagine, is wildly different from the Midwest. Uh, it is geologically diverse, sitting at the convergence of the Rocky Mountains, the Great Basin, and the Colorado Plateau. Since moving here, I have been particularly interested in the desert landscape. It is both beautiful and hostile, and especially unique because of its proximity to the Great Salt Lake. Um, as you probably know, the West Desert is the piece of land um, that I-80 runs through if you're driving from Chicago to San Francisco. It is also the site of several of the works and a reference point for the images made in my studio. Um, and this particular image uh, will reappear in a few slides. The West Desert is managed by the Bureau of Land Management um, or BLM and is, is referred to as public lands. It is also home to the Dugway Proving Ground, which you can see through the various pink areas, um, but particularly here, um, which is a US military owned testing site for biological and chemical weapons. Uh, BLM land or public lands as they're often referred to are frequently used for target practice, off-road vehicles, hiking and other outdoor activities. While these lands are theoretically free to use, significant acreage is leased to private extraction companies and cattle ranchers both of which have a significant ecological impact on the land. The locations I have focused on, uh, Stansbury Island and, and uh, several locations in Skull Valley, are areas that people frequent to shoot guns, uh, typically at the earth, which is perhaps a byproduct of their shooting at large household appliances and other non-biodegradable objects. The remnants of these objects are typically left on site. Um, as I spent more time in the desert, I began to collect these objects and brought them into my studio to be photographed on a backdrop um, of their original location and then used uh, that for a larger installation purpose. Um, and in this image, you can see uh, the first image I showed, which was taken um, from Skull Valley. 
Um, around this time, so this would have been late 2019, um, I created two body suits um, made of latex paint, one that exaggerated the gendered body and one that hid it. Um, I have since made other another body suit and other costuming pieces, um, which you'll see in the new video work in a few um, in a few slides. Um, around the time that I made these body suits, I also was doing a lot of in camera um, collaging with four by five film. Um, the work began to really reference uh, ecofeminism and the subjugation of the gendered body in the landscape. Um, I'm not particularly interested in all aspects of ecofeminism because much of it is rooted in dualism, uh, which reinforces problematic binaries. However, the exploitation and subjugation of women prevailing in patriarchal societies can be associated with the domination and massive exploitation of nature by humans. This is rooted in the fact that the subjugation of women means devaluation of women who individually and categorically share historical, social, and political identities with the natural world. So this image and the previous image um, were taken on a single sheet of four by five film with in-camera masking and the center sort of outline that you're seeing in both of these images is um, the reproduction of my birthmark. Um, this next image was similarly made with a different masking technique. Um, I also began to incorporate the green screen, um, which reappears in the video work as well, um, as a way to further explore how the gendered body could oscillate between visibility and invisibility and as a way to address how um, the, the body, particularly the white female body could be both marked and weaponized in an effort to maintain power. Additionally, the desert is often viewed as the backdrop for activities, um, shooting guns, making art, hiking, uh, framing it as simply a backdrop or a green screen erases the significance and complexity of the land, its history, uses, and exploitation. Um, the grid format or use of multiples that is included in several of the works references cartographic methods used for map making um, relating to the idea of creating borders or boundaries as a method in which violence is built into the structure and often shows up as unequal power. Um, this leads me into the work that I'm working on or creating for the Digital Matters grant. Um, here you can see a studio view um, with myself and one of my assistants from the first of five production days. Um, we haven't completed the production of the video, um, but I'm going to share um, various excerpts and clips um, and progress that has been made from the first several shoots. The, um, so the first few production days took place in the studio, um, which was used as a site to reconstruct the desert. The background used in this piece is a site um, on Stansbury Island where my assistants and I will be going in a few weeks, um, two weeks I think exactly, um, to start the location portion of production. Um, you can also see the new bodysuit that I created um, as well as the clay pigeon bikini, um, both of which were constructed specifically for this piece. So the American landscape is a trope represented through many photographic surveys. It is inextricably linked to a deep fascination with the American West, which can be seen through westward expansion, cowboy fantasies, the desire to secure resources, and the development of the transcontinental railroad, all of which use images as a form of propaganda. The, photograph used, the photographs used as um, propaganda and in these surveys sought to document, aestheticize, and colonize the lands viewed through the camera's lens. Um, for example, photographs of the Transcontinental Railroad, which were created um, by many people, but particularly Andrew J. Russell, uh, were used to both document and develop uh, the development of the railroad, as well as encourage westward migration. The land was seen as an opportunity for mining and extraction, um, all in the name of progress and capital. And in the 1950s, the Marlboro Man um, was used by cigarette advertisers, um, which speaks to the sort of cowboy fantasies. Um, the West Desert continues to highlight these cowboy myths in the American West, which have generated macho and heroic semi-barbarian mythologies, which is played out through the destruction and domination of the land and privileged, idea, pri privileged ideas about what one's rights are. Uh, 
Um, this piece was made in an effort to sort of contrast the previous clip. Um, I do imagine that this piece um, will sort of intersect with the um, previous slide in the final production or final um, sequencing of the video. So both location and studio-based works reference the West Desert to critique contradictions regarding individual rights, access, and land use, and their relationship to capitalism, manifest destiny, and power. Um, I wanna end with this piece, which was a test shot from last fall, um, which is where we will be going, um, my, my assistants and I will be going in a few weeks to shoot the remaining footage. Um, I intend for the production of the video work to be completed over the summer. Um, and I look forward to sharing it um, hopefully with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. John? Great. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, are you able to see the slideshow? Yes. Yeah. Um, so my project is called Native Places, an Indigenous Atlas of Utah and Intermountain West. And as Rebecca said, I'm a PhD student in the Department of History and a joint fellow between Digital Matters and the American West Center. Um, first, I want to give thanks to a whole lot of people because this was a pretty big project that a lot of people have worked on with me. Um, the folks at Digital Matters for the funding, as well as mentorship with some challenges that came up with this project, um, particularly to Justin Sorensen, who helped a lot with the technical aspect, and Jeff Turner, who kind of laid the foundation for everything that I was able to do and was a crucial resource, as well as uh, my advisor, Greg Smoke, and Scott Morris, my colleague, who did a lot of the primary historical research. So what is Native Places? Essentially, it's a map, but it's this interactive map that works to restore indigenous place names to their original geographic features. So it's a map of Utah and the Intermountain West with these points across it. <clears throat> and when you click on these points, it will prioritize the indigenous place name as opposed to the uh, settler colonialist, colonialist or the USGS place name. Um, and this map is a response to this history of settler colonialism across the American West where um, Euro-Americans and USGS surveys came and imposed their own place names on regions of the American West that already had cultures and histories and people associated with them. So how it works is we actually took this database from the geological survey and we're working against it to provide the indigenous place names. So we downloaded uh, this publicly available database from the USGS you can see that it's really massive. It's um, 430 pages, our geographic region now, and started to use that as a backdrop to make our own data. So we then did some uh, primary historical research to find the indigenous place names, as well as consultations with native groups of Utah to find the original place names for these regions. So what our spreadsheet started to look like was if you see along the left side, you'll have the category and the feature. So rivers and streams, big cottonwood, as well as the location, and then the language group, the dialect or local culture, and then the place name along with some notes and citations. Once we started to build this up, and we have about 463 entries at this point, this was converted into a file um, and we use ArcGIS to map this. And here is what the original map looked like. It was divided in these five categories of Shoshone, Goshu, Navajo, Paiute, and Ute. Um, and then the next step was developing this web app that is interactive where you can explore the um, data we have. So I'm gonna stop sharing so I can switch over to showing you the actual web map at this point. And are you able to see this now? Yes. Great. Um, so when you land on the web app, you'll get this 
splash screen pop-up that's an introduction as well as a little bit of instructions on how to use it. Click OK. And if we zoom out a little bit, you'll see the spread across the um, American West of the locations of these place names. And like I said, these are interactive. So you can click on any of these and you'll have a pop-up. So if we look at the San Juan Mountains, the first thing you'll see is the indigenous place name. We wanted to prioritize this. So this is what will appear at the top of these pop-ups, followed by the language, um, the translation, and sometimes some additional notes of where that name comes from. And then what we're calling the USGS name, which is the contemporary name that people usually associate with these areas. And then the category. So this is a mountain range. Um, if we wanted to look at a different one up here, the Snake River, um, same thing. You'll have the place name, the language, um, Eastern Shoshone, and then you see there's a little bit more information of the translation of where it comes from. So there's a lot of different ways to explore this map other than just clicking on these points. If we go up here to the top right, we can have a list view that will have every single entry, all 463. Um, and if you wanted to explore this way, you can click and you'll see it'll highlight the area and then you'll have that pop up as well. Um, you can also go over here to a couple of different tools as well. So of course we have a legend that will give you the breakdown of the color coding, how we've divided this. Um, but if you wanted to do a little bit more intricate exploration, um, we have certain features where you can filter by certain types. So if I'm looking for something specific, say I want to only see uh, rivers and mountains, I can come up to this mountain icon, click on it, and I can filter by all the different geographic features. So I'm going to toggle on rivers and streams, and then both mountain ranges and mountain peaks. So what happens is both the map itself updates as long as over here on the right are list view updates. So now everything that appears on the map is either a river, stream, or something associated with a mountain. But we can go a step further, say, I'm interested in rivers and mountains that have either a Shoshone place name or a Navajo place name. So underneath that mountain icon is our languages, and we can toggle these on as well. So let's do Navajo and Shoshone. And again, you see that the map updates and our list view over here as well. So everything that appears on this map is either a Navajo or Shoshone spot that is a mountain or a river. Let's go ahead and clear that out. And I'm going to close this out as well. So um, an additional way to search this is you can actually search for specific uh, place names. So if we come down here to this magnifying glass, this is our search by place name. You have two options here. You could either search by the indigenous place name, if you know it, or the USGS name. So let's go ahead and look for an indigenous place name. You'll see you have this pop-up prompt that says place name is blank. And then here, we'll just type in alpha, click enter, and it will zoom in onto this specific place name and give us that information there as well. So I'll zoom out so we can get a better idea. So you see we have the place name and then a description of where this name comes from. X out of that. Let's try searching by the USGS name. And let's go local and look at Antelope Island. Click Enter. And we'll see we zoom in on Antelope Island and have the information about that. Another feature that we have to help visualize where these areas are is if you click up here on the right on this layer list, you can actually look at a satellite imagery instead of a topographic one um, to kind of get an idea of what these landscapes look like. And now you can see that the Salt Lake is slowly draining and not looking too good over here. But if we X out of that and let's go back to our topographic, so those are the ways to explore this map and see how there are a vast array of place names that already exist across the Intermountain West. Um, the last thing, and one of our biggest challenges was how to make this publicly available and encourage engagement, not only with the public, but specifically with native peoples of Utah, because we have done historical research, but the next step is to bring um, tribal leaders in to help us 
to, to fill out this map more. So ideally in the future, there will be way more dots than this on this map. And so over here, um, and kind of the next steps on this would be in this eye icon, would be a variety of resources of how uh, people can suggest edits, make comments, um, give new place names, get in contact with us at the American West Center, and also download the data set itself and use for their own research purposes. Uh, but for the time being, I wanted to make the data itself publicly available because I feel like that is a way to kind of get around this problem we've had of making this an open source and um, fighting against this idea of settler colonialism by using a proprietary system. So if you come down here and click on this, let me bring this up a little bit higher, you'll be actually able to see our full data sheet. Um, and there's a lot more information in here. So if you come over here, each area will have um, the place name, a little bit more information, the notes, as well as the citation. So where this information comes from, if it's either a historical source or um, Northwest Band Shoshone data is the case for this particular one here. Um, so we wanted to give as much information as we could in a really seamless and user-friendly way. So the first step is just the map, but there's a lot of different layers in um, how you can explore this and how you can learn about this. Um, there are a lot of issues with that because we're trying to make this really easy to use. Um, so having this be a fluid walkthrough for people. So it's not exactly apparent that you can filter through all of these things and how to use this unless you sat through a demo kind of like this is. So that's our next challenge to address as well as how to provide um, kind of a technical walkthrough for people to explore this. Um, but beyond that, it is pretty easy to just get in and start clicking around and exploring. Um, and the idea is that as people do this, they'll not only learn, but they can make suggestions and edits and help us grow this list to fight against this long history of settler colonialism that has essentially remapped the entire American West. Um, so thank you for, I'm going to stop sharing, following along with that. And I do look forward to any questions or comments that people have at the end. Thank you, John. Daniel, you're up next. Wow, what tough acts to follow. Um, but I'm learning so much. And about half of what I've learned today is going to apply to my own work over the coming months. So I'm excited to share. Let's see. So my project. Um, Let's load up for a second here. Sorry, it's still loading for me. There you go, now it's loaded. So my project is tentatively titled um, Open Wounds. And I, you know, it's a, as far as a, the title and how I even talk about some of this stuff, I'm still trying to figure that out as well. You know, the, the nuances of language are pretty important to me as a creative writing PhD student. So um, if anyone ever, if anyone listening to any of this has any suggestions for how to talk about some of this stuff, not that it's that complicated, other folks are working on much more difficult problems of language than I am, but it's there. So anyway, for right now though, I think open wounds is the driving metaphor of this project. And it's a two part project. The first part is in mapping and the second part is in attempting to effectively narrativize uh, Utah's visible geological damage using ArcGIS, which uh, John is using in story maps. And an important part for me for this for sake of this project really is the idea of the visible damage. Um, it's about kind of an impression. And so I'm not necessarily looking at all mines, although I, that's kind of a starting point. I'm really looking at mines that dramatically define our viewing landscapes. You know, the mines and the, the kind of tissue damage that you can see exposed against the sky. Because capitalism is transformative. Um, from Kennecott's record setting open pit mine in the ochres to the rainbow colored potash ponds of Moab, um, Utah's uniquely beautiful, and as I've come to learn since moving here, uniquely sensitive landscape is visibly damaged by the effects of uh, you know 133 plus years of statehood, plus another 50 years of settler colonial capitalism. Um, it is amongst all the places I've lived, I'm from Mississippi, I'm from the deep south, I've never lived anywhere with such extensive geological visible damage. There are reasons for that that might extend beyond the scope of mining, for example, like in the deep south where you have tree cover, but it was enough to, to get me started on this project. Um, like again, I hope to create a relatively simple representation. And then because I do believe that narrative and language can be transformative, hope to push back against that destructive transformation of capitalism in some way 
um, using, a, using a story map, which is a kind of platform technology offered by ArcGIS to tell a story through their own maps. They work very closely with their map sets. So the first step has been trying to map this visual damage, which involves a combination of existing maps. Um, as, as John showed, there are, there are many layers and maps within ArcGIS that I, USGS data, for example, that I've been able to access. A lot of satellite imagery, um, because there's a lot of places that I can't access from the road still, plenty of private land that they don't really want you to get into. Uh, government databases, and then that surprisingly important part of just field research, which is just me driving around, of course, um, and just seeing what I can see. And so I've just been marketing and cataloging as many resource extraction sites um, as I can and as are visible. And so this illustration on the right kind of shows you where I am right now. It's a bit of a, up here is, is kind of gives you a sense of where the impression I'm trying to give the, I'm gonna go back a little bit. The southern half of this map is actually right now kind of cheating. I'm using heat maps of coal mines just to give myself a working picture as I pinpoint some more specific sites. So some of this is actually not really necessarily an accurate representation of the way the landscape has been what I would consider disfigured, but the northwest portion uh, very much is. So uh, the map itself also does have um, a set of mining data attached to it. For example, what was mined when, uh, <clears throat> by who, um, for example. And so this categories have kind of arisen um, in terms of, for me, what I've recognized as the major kind of disfiguring forces. Um, gold and silver is one, and it's, a, it's an early, more historical uh, example. It, it, it seems to have really, the, the gold and silver mines really figured into the settling. Uh, so that's part of my story map. Now these illustrations on the right are just screenshots from the various parts of my story map I'm working on. Copper, of course, um, being the sort of primary product of the open pit Kennecott mine is now um, a, a, a major concern for this piece. Um, I've been looking at salt, salt mining. It's a little bit different than some of these other metals, but um, the Salt mining is also a way to look directly more at the ecology of the salt lake, which as, as John just actually gestured to is, and, and we're all pretty familiar with, I'm sure, um, facing a lot of, of problems and challenges right now, including drying up. But more than drying up, it is also partitioned and uh, polluted to an arguable extent, um, depending on who you ask, um, by these major mining conglomerations, particularly magnesium. Um, and then potash maybe is a little bit different than the other ones. It's, an, it's a different kind of disfigurement, but it's just too definitive to Utah's kind of visual landscape for me to ignore. So these are, you know, some of these big, beautiful uh, ponds. You, we have them out in Wendover, and then we also have a few out in Moab. And I'm not really sure where I'm going with this now. So you can see I don't even have a slide really started. I just have it in my story map. But I, you know, I wanted to mention it. Uranium and the war. So these are, we've also kind of moved chronologically through time through these categories, through the history of mining. And in you know the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we have uranium mining and we have kind of this growth of test ranges. And the test ranges are a, a different kind of mechanism of damage, as are the uranium, because the uranium to me, what I noticed when I was traveling in that area, this is this would be you know, the, the Red Rock Desert where I was, at least where I noticed this, is that sensitivity of the landscape where just the, the old uh, truck roads that the uranium miners took just permanently scarred the desert down there. Maybe not permanently, but for a very long term have scarred that desert. So you look out and you can see just crisscrossing tracks and lines. Here in this image, you can see uh, what appears to be a kind of bombing test site. Um, in the west of the Salt Lake. So I'm also looking at that, which moves more into maybe arguably the military industrial complex than uh, mining specifically. But those are sort of the five major categories that I've started through. And the gold, silver, and copper are definitely, because of some of the way they're extracted, the more visible ones. There's nothing like the open pit copper mine, of course. That's kind of the, the greatest one of all. But the rest of Utah is full of mysterious little mining operations as well. So in the course of this project, 
I've encountered some things I never heard of before, like a uh, which is mined around, I think, near Helper and Price, uh, just in that area, or it might be in the Uinta Basin. Some of these are, are kind of on both sides there. Um, and it's, you know, a kind of, a kind of petroleum byproduct, a waxy, uh, like, uh, like you'd make a record out of. Asphalt type beryllium, of course, they, they mine um, gems, fossils. I've been considering to what extent fossils are part of this kind of calculus of capitalistic resource extraction. The coal mines are so definitive and major, but they're a little bit tough because I, the, the, the visible aspect shifts and, and efforts of reclamation, um, which is also part of the story, define the coal process a little bit more. But I've also learned that some, some of the stuff I don't even think of as resource extraction, like sand and stone for, for you know, like building stone are actually some of the most major sources of, for example, mountains disappearing. So lots of stuff to look at too. And I'm, I'm still kind of working my way through this kind of list. Natural gas, I think is a, is a very problematic part of our history. We have a big natural gas fields north of Nine Mile Canyon. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to zip through the last. The second part of this is just story mapping this, uh, which is a suite of cartographically oriented presentation and media tools, basically slideshows, guided map tours, embedded audio and video um, to tell this story. Narratively, this has been um, definitely provides some difficulties for me. It's, it's a new material for me as an experimental writer. So it's a lot to think about in terms of how authorship works. You know, is it the, the cartographer? Is it me as a kind of organizer or writer or observer? Is it the miners themselves, the people who affected this landscape or is it the landscape? Um, maps are flat, but language is linear. So how, do, how can I push away from the linearity of language and into the sort of de-hierarchized, at least in one arguable sense, a perspective of the map, um, which is something I've been struggling with. My linear, my, my narrative is essentially still linear. It's also essentially chronological and historical. It's kind of just, that was the way it made sense to me to map this data was how did we get here and kind of what happened next? What happened next? What happened next? But I would like to transition now to a more spatial and experiential narrative, uh, maybe more based on my own authorship experiences, a, a more photographic uh, experience and less more, more from the ground level than from the top down, for example. And yeah, so as I've kind of mentioned, since I'm out of time, I'll just close here, but th these are all the issues I've brought up and my own uncertainties and doubts going through this are, are kind of the things I'm still trying to close in now, now that I have a better sense of the underlying technology. So now that I kind of have a sense of how to, how to make my spreadsheet, collect my data, map that data, and then control that data, I can think a little more hard about uh, some of these, these conceptual and research-based questions and about where this project begins and ends. For example, I have been considering um, non-mining geographical alterations because once you're trained to read the landscape for that kind of capitalistic damage, um, transportation infrastructure, particularly because so many of the, the railroads are, are mining related, that seem, you know, these big visible scars like the uranium tracks across the landscape. And then of course you start raising questions about residential development because you know, carving these sides out of these mountains, for example, from here to Provo, down along Lehigh and Point of the Mountain, that seems like it should be involved here as well, but that wasn't necessarily the kind of calculus that I was, the kind of impression I was trying to paint. So my hope is that this project will um, provide a, a kind, you know, an easily readable and effective narrative to potentially galvanize uh, people into action against doing whatever we can to reverse some of this damage, stop it. It's still going on. Of course, these mines are still operating. Rio Tinto is bigger than ever. Um, they, so uh, it's not just a historical problem. It's also a problem for the present day. Uh, I want to thank Justin, Rebecca Merson, everyone at the library for being so incredibly supportive, and my peers, and John, and, and Danielle, and everyone as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Daniel. And our last presenter today is Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Waters, and my project is the Youth Activist Art Archive. So the, this is a website that showcases youth activist art from around the world, and we wanted it to be an open access digital tool that's a resource for both young artists 
and also adult facilitators and teachers who are interested in making art for social change. So I'm an art teacher, I teach photography, and it's been a really weird year for teachers. There's a need for more digital tools that can reach and teach young students. So we wanted this project to be um, able to reach a broad audience and eventually be an internationally um, supported uh, archive and also be sustainable as a, a long term project. So this will extend well beyond me and my project with Digital Matters. Um, I'm in the Master of Fine Arts teaching program and Beth Krinsky, the head of art teaching has been really supportive of this project and I've really been um, supported by her expertise in this. So thank you, Beth. Um, let's see. So Beth and I were discussing and the thing is art and activism have a really connected relationship and art is such a powerful tool for social change. But there are a lot of resources out there for artists who are interested in making art for social change. But when it comes to young people specifically, um, there's not as many digital tools and resources out there. So we're hoping that this will fill a, a needed gap, um, specifically looking at young artists that are 26 years and under is the age range that we're looking at. It's the, um, it's the people that are younger than all of us here in this Zoom call. Like it's the group of, of young students, like elementary age, middle school, high school, young college, like they have important things to say. And I think sometimes we forget that. And I'm a, I'm a teacher and I'm also a mom. So I, am, I spend a lot of time around people that are younger than me and they are inspirational and passionate. And when it comes specifically to activism, I think youth bring a lot of unique assets like creativity and the resiliency that's needed to make sustainable changes in society. Um, young people also like they have more energy and free time than a lot of us adults. So they, they um, and this like contagious amount of hope and inspiration in the world that makes them really good at activism. And so I think having more of a platform and more resources for young artists who are interested in art for social change is so important. And I'm really excited about this project. Okay, so um, just diving into like, my research, this was phase one, which started last semester. And I just started by researching what projects are already out there. So what um, art mediums and social issues are young people making art about? And um, I found a lot of uh, large scale organizations and nonprofits who are making big projects that are involving youth. But I also found individual artists who are making art that about a variety of social issues that they're interested in. So I just started gathering. Um, I have a, almost 100 entries of just what projects exist out there. And then I went through and was trying to narrow down what social issues we're going to cover. So the we'll, archive will have these eight main social issues. And then we have subcategories for each issue, like for environment, um, we have climate change, recycling, pollution, animal rights that would all be underneath that category. And in my own art and photography, I like adding um, text with my images and I do some art with label makers. So I made these like little label maker things with my, uh, for like our design and then for the, these eight categories. So that was a fun process trying to think of like the branding and the feel of um, the website. So then this is the actual website. It's not um, completely finished and not like live yet, but the art and art history department ended up helping us a lot, which was so great. We were so grateful. So this was gonna be our main landing page and you'll see there's um, resources and research both for young artists and also for facilitators and teachers. We're gonna have lesson plans on here for educators that wanna facilitate art projects about social issues. And then so a submission page. And then you can see it 
like clicking on here where you can browse the social issues, or if you click on the archive tab right here, um, that will take you to a separate site, which is the actual archive. And this part is through the library. And Rebecca helped me a lot with this, which was really great. And Anna and everybody at the library, they knew of Omeka, which is a digital exhibit tool. So this is hosted through Omeka through the library, and it's just a, a different exhibit link. Um, so this is the actual archive. And we made everything be searchable by the various categories. So health, racial justice, environment, gender, all the different social issues, you can search through and look at art just by that issue. Or you can also browse through based on the art medium. So if you're like, oh, I just want to see what exists out there in 3D art or um, photography, you can search specific for that medium. So just a little bit on the back end of the Omeka, I want to show you. So this is, we have the item sets. And um, this is one of the items. And Nate, Nate Milch made this. He's a, a art, art teaching student at the university. So you can see this is his piece that we uploaded a photograph of. And the tags for this are mixed media 3D. And then the social issues are gender and LGBT. And I just want to read you this little description of this art because it's so great. It says, named after the toy Amal Santa suggested when he heard a five-year-old boy ask for a Barbie, Hot Wheels was based on the shame boys with feminine interests feel when they are socialized to feel as such. A baby blue coffin is the final resting place for a collection of disfigured dolls, a mournful symbol of bearing one's feelings to conform. So this is a great gender social issue that he made in response. Um, and so we'll, we'll have a variety of sculptures, murals, paintings, photographs um, that will all be in the archive. And it's going to continue to grow and grow, which is also really exciting. So right now, the main thing that we're doing is looking for submissions, trying to find more people to reach out to. And we're contacting artists and educators to submit. So this is our submission page and this page is live. So I'm going to share it in the chat and you feel free along with a flyer and then you can pass it around to anybody that you think might be interested. Um, we ran into a couple of hangups with the legal stuff for permissions because we're looking at um, our demographic is youth and the, so they're a protected um, minor and so they need like uh, parental uh, permissions for in a lot of cases if they're under 18. So when we did the submission page, um, you can see that they can upload it right here into the box and it comes straight to us. And we needed to create a submission form and a legal permission form. So these are the two forms that they have to fill out to submit to the archive. And you can see that we're letting the artist choose these tags. So like they will click on which medium apply and which social issue they feel like apply. And that's the tags that we're gonna use in the archive so you can search, search through. Um, so this is the uh, flyer that we're passing out. We're looking right now um, more locally and then we're hoping to expand nationally and then internationally. Right now we, we're sending out emails to U of U students and um, local art educators and then we're going to be sending out a national email to get submissions um, later on. So uh, thank you to Digital Matters, the library and art and art history department, Beth and Nate, and uh, it's been a really wonderful project. It's been really inspiring and hopeful for me to work on this project and um, thank you. That, that, that's it. Oh. Thank you so much. Okay, let's take a minute just to thank all of our speakers in any way that you do. Actual clapping, clap emojis. Good job, everyone. That was fantastic. Yep, I love the jazz hands. Um, and I just, I just wanna say, this has been a tough semester for everyone and to see what you have all accomplished has been truly inspiring for me as well. So well done, everybody. Um, we are gonna open the floor up to questions now for all of our speakers. I did have one announcement. Um, several people have asked me if we're going to hold a Digital Humanities Utah Symposium this year. DHU is what we often call it. We do a symposium every year in Utah. We go from university to university hosting. This was the year um, that BYU was going to host it. 
And we met together as a planning committee and decided we are gonna hold off until spring 2022. So for those of you who are interested in showing your work, please do plan on you know, presenting at DHU and attending in spring 2022. Okay. Oh, and Danielle just shared a file and that link in the chat box for anyone who's interested or know people who might be interested in submitting to the Youth Activist Art Archive. Okay, and with that, what questions do we have for our speakers? I have a question for Danielle. Um, so Danielle, I'm with the Utah Education Network. So my question for you is, you, you mentioned the permissions for uploading content. Thank you for anticipating that. Um, my question is regarding the content itself. Are there specific guidelines? Um, and the reason why I'm asking is that if we publish this out to the K-12 space um, through us, there's always those questions about filtering and concerns and stuff. So just would love to know what if there's any parameters around the content that I should be aware of. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that we're, we're definitely gearing it towards youth. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. I don't know if I thought about necessarily, do you mean filtering the content as far as like the images and the artwork that we'll be receiving? Because we are curating the archive, not everything that will be submitted will be accepted. Yeah, you know, so, you know, the artist in me is like, let it rip. But, uh, you know, at U UE and, you know, we we hear squawking from all over if like there's even a little side boob. Let's be frank. Um, so, so that's really, I'm just kind of wondering when I'm thinking about what markets I would share this information with, um, I want to curate that in consistent with, with the kind of content you foresee wanting to support. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good thing we'll have to keep in mind. I think we are I, that hadn't like nudity hadn't crossed my mind, honestly, but I think we're gearing it towards youth. So that is something that we would definitely um, keep in mind and, and be careful about. Good question. I'll email you offline for more I conversation. Would love to talk more. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for the entirety of the panel. That's okay, Rebecca. Yes. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, I, I, I wonderful presentations. I liked just how uh, there's so much resonance between all the presentations, and they seem to be in conversation with each other. They're all making kind of connections between history, art, and the environment for largely social and cultural change. Right. And this is kind of a pretty optimistic view of technology as bringing about that change. Um, so, I want to kind of uh, switch positions here, and I want to ask the panel to address the counter argument of the pitfalls and dangers of digital methods and tools. If you see any things that worry you, uh, traps to avoid, if you've given any thought to um, how things could go awry. I can actually speak to that because I dealt with this a lot last year at the workshop that I attended. Um, it was a week long workshop and we were supposed to be in Florida, but due to COVID it was, essentially nine to five everyday workshop for a week. And I was um, very interested in the fact that ethical issues were probably half of what we discussed. Like I, I was mostly there to learn the tools, but with every tool and with every everything that we discussed for that entire week, we dealt a lot with the ethical issues. And especially a lot of us were working on Twitter at that event. And what I learned in the interim time that actually has impacted me a lot, which people here might be interested to know, I published the piece on Riverdale um, and Star, Force, Star Wars Force Awakens in 2019, but I obviously had sent that in like two years earlier. So that means I started working on this in 2017. And since then, everyone who's working on Twitter does not directly cite the Twitter um, usernames. So that's, it's really interesting how this process has changed because well, I have a piece published where I do cite the usernames. But since then, we everybody says, please don't cite the usernames because they don't want that negative effect of trolling to happen to those people. Even though technically those tweets are public, there can be real life consequences if someone finds out the 
the real person that's connected to that Twitter username, right? So a lot of the discussion I had in 2020 was, and that, again, that piece was studied, published in 2019, in 2020 was, I really have to change a lot of my project because a lot of my project was about directly citing the Twitter, Twitter quotes and directly citing those usernames. And now the discussion among everybody who's working on Twitter is you should avoid that as much as possible. You should get permission to directly cite those Twitter um, users. And of course that's impossible when you have 8,000 tweets, right? So this is something that I'm definitely directly addressing because of the ethical consequences and the real life consequences of posting this public data. So I'm trying to, I'm realizing I have to do an entire section. That's what people are doing. I have to do an entire section of my book about the ethical use of Twitter data. I can take this one with regards to cryptocurrency. And I always think about media scholar Gretchen Soderlin, who really nicely and poetically talks about how digital media dispossesses just as much as it empowers. And with indigenous cryptocurrency, there are tons and tons out there that are, that are basically totally predatory, ones that are using basically poverty point, uh, porn techniques of putting poor people on front of their images and saying that it's going to help when the code itself has actually nothing to do with those crypt uh, with those particular outputs that they want. So it takes a lot of critical uh, skills in order to figure out which ones are bad and which ones are good. And also just remembering that indigenous people, you know, have this profound digital divide where broadband internet, for instance, isn't even close to being as equal as it is throughout the entire US and the underlying technology that you might need to use these uh, crypto might not even exist. And Marissa Duarte and a lot of great scholars talk about that as well. But yeah, it, really important not to just take a techno optimistic you know, view of everything because at the end of the day, humans are humans. Great, thank I, you. Uh, sorry, go. Sorry, I think I interrupted somebody. Well, I was just going to pop. I love your question because it's, I, I've just been thinking about it a lot and trying to think of a million different thoughtful ways to respond. And for, because I, I've been having that difficulty with media in general as well, particularly, I mean, when, when the digital space, you're kind of in a mediated space, I think maybe, maybe definitionally a little more than you are in the physical space, you know, on zoom, it's a media of video, audio and, and image. And so a map potentially can can form a, a new type of perspective or, or story time but it can also especially once you marry it with more linear media just replicate a misunderstanding and a hierarchy that um, kind of allowed us to create these massive structures in the first place and destroy our landscape so for me the question is really particularly to well it is language actually powerful or transformative um, or is narrative transformative and is language powerful powerful enough at least to go up against, you know, 200 ton diggers and, and what, what have you out there and, and $200 billion worth of capital and Rio Tinto and everything like that. So I think that's a question that very much pushes to the heart of narrative as well and, and media a little bit more generally, um, which just gets yeah, elevated in this digital context. Well, I have a very practical question actually for Jacqueline. I loved your work and I loved your slides and I'm wondering if you're planning on showing, um, doing a larger exhibition of your work that we could go see either virtually or in person at some point. I hope so. Um, I, I actually recently, just two weeks ago, shared um, at SF um, San Francisco Camera Work um, the progress that I've made on this particular project. And they've um, asked me to um, do a lecture once I've actually completed the, the video piece. Um, so hopefully I'll be giving a, a lecture and um, showcasing it through um, San Francisco camera work sometime over the summer. Um, and then I've also been um, submitting it to open calls in various ways of, of sort of showing it um, the video piece in addition to thinking about installation tactics, particularly um, sort of recreating that desert landscape with the, the various sort of artifacts and remnants from site. Um, to have those in conversation with one another. Um, so yeah, hoping that that will happen um, sometime in the fall, but definitely through SF camera work, um, probably over the summer. So yeah. Great. Well, if you wanna have help publicizing that, please do let us know at Digital Matters. Sure, yeah, thank you. 
Oh, Max, do you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to ask John, I mean, since a lot of the work you're doing is sort of like, is, is inflected by the fact that you're trying to be linguistically, you know, like honest to some of these place names and use the original uh, names in, in these different languages. I was curious about like technically if you ran into problems like uh, using those place names and how that works on sort of like the back end, if there were any technical problems that actually came from using non-English names and, and the data and how all that was all, you had any things that you had to work out with that. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, how to divide it was a really crucial first step because um, there's a mix of understanding that's how groups self-identify and then this like anthropological um, and like settled colonialist view. So we we're trying to be really conscious of these political and cultural divides. Um, as far as the technical aspects, um, it we were really concerned because we were using the Navajo alphabet and we weren't sure if those characters were gonna translate because you know we're, we have a couple of different steps from um, data sheets, to CSV files, and then actually like the back end of the map. Luckily, uh, it works pretty well with any keyboard. So we were able to do that um, pretty seamlessly. So technically it wasn't a challenge, it was more conceptually how to divide up these categories. And we're still kind of um, working with that because we're trying to be sensitive to a lot of different um, issues of how to like you know we're doing these big umbrella terms so there are a lot of implications and problems with that while we are trying to create this decolonized map so that was like our biggest challenge i'd say oh beth do you have a question i do so this is for um all of the presenters i don't know how long ago you wrote your proposals to digital matters but you know, when we write proposals, we all say we're going to do this thing and we expect certain outcomes. I'm curious at this point, as you look back, what are some of the things or thing that, it, that have been poignant for you that you have come across or learned or realized that you had not expected to? I'm happy, I can go first. <laughs> Um, one thing, I mean, this is a, the work that I'm working on has, I started before I came to Utah and of course it's, it's very seriously, um, changed as a result of being here. And I think the more that I sort of investigate it, the deeper I sort of go. And I've only recently have I really began to think about the sort of mythology of, um, cowboys in the American West, which seems like, you know, sometimes I think about it now and I'm like, that's such an obvious connection when I'm like using all of these objects that are totally obliterated in the desert that sort of speak to the um, trauma and the history of uh, colonialism, particularly in the West. Um, so that's been a sort of interesting discovery that I have only recently started doing more research on and only happened as a result of um, really getting into this and creating this video piece. I was just going to say, like, I think everything just takes longer than I think it's going to <laughs> just generally like one day I ended up spending hours just making sure I was using the correct language. And I mean, had to do a lot of research of just that that day. And so like, there were a lot of unexpected things where like time, time was strange, but that's a good question, Beth. Um, I can say I, I was really interested in like what my, when I first met with my research assistant, Mitch, who I think had to leave, um, he asked me, what do I want my images to look like? And I ended up saying, I know what they don't want, what I don't want them to look like. <laughs> and what, because some of the images that I came up with at the, um, at the event that I attended last summer, they, they looked, I showed them to people, things like word maps and things like that, where people were like, we've been doing this for decades. How is that new? And I was thinking, and so that's been one of my struggles is how to, I, this is my first time doing anything with data visualization. I have no experience beyond this one week event that I attended. So I, I'm still struggling to find what do I want it to look like? So I'm, I'm feeling like there's a lot more um, trial and error than I expected as part of the process. Some things aren't working. The images that I've seen in other books about hashtags, I, I don't want to replicate those because I don't find them as useful as other places. So that's that's something I didn't expect. For me, Digital Matters as a group has been very 
um, inviting in terms of like you shoot for the stars, maybe shoot for the moon and maybe land on, I don't know, Everest or something. Uh, and that, and that I think for myself, particularly, I really don't have a meaningful, uh, background in the kind of technology I'm trying to use. Um, but that, you know, I was still invited to do this. And so I've, I've encountered kind of natural problems along the ways in which, well, I don't, I don't even know how to do what, what would even, I don't know how to code, for example, but I need a little bit of code here. Um, but that's just been, for me, at least that hasn't really been an issue because everyone has just allowed me to just kind of give me the advice I need and keep plugging along. So yeah, I would agree with Danielle that it does mean a little bit of a time extension for me. Maybe I, uh, bit off more than I was too, but I really appreciate that that impulse to to allow us to kind of maybe dream a little bit beyond our initial uh, capabilities and then let those capabilities catch up. Yeah, I agree with what Danielle said too. I found the extension of time really helpful because there's a lot of different people that helped me out that came from very different backgrounds that pointed out things I would never have noticed. Like um, I think Greg pointed out accessibility of people who are colorblind the way our map appears to the sensitivity of these language language groups from um, people in American West Center. So there's a lot of different people that helped me. And it really showed how this interdisciplinary nature of digital matters is very helpful to kind of shape these, you know, the crossover of humanities and digital tools. Okay, if we don't have any other, you know, presenters weighing in on challenges. We probably have time for maybe one more question. Uh, I have one other question. Uh, this is for Sarah um, with regards to her uh, Twitter project or Twitter research. Um, I wondered if you have thoughts about um, the Snyder Cut uh, being released and how toxic fandom has been rewarded uh, through this mechanism and if that troubles you at all with regards to hashtag activism. Yeah, so this is, this is my ongoing problem with this project is every time I give a talk about it, everyone wants to hear about the haters. And I, I'm so, I tried that because I did give a talk on the Batwoman, um, recast Batwoman hashtag. And it was really hard on me because reading and investigating all those negative trollers, it, it's, it's so toxic that I, I was immersed in it for so long that I'm really, I'm truly struggling with that. But I, I feel like it's certainly a necessary part of my project. I'm hoping when I get to the editor stage of this project that they'll be okay with that it's one chapter out of four, that they won't make me make two chapters out of four about the haters. But I definitely, I, I, I certainly value having to talk about it. And there's a lot of work on anti-fandom that's being done that's really helpful for making my arguments in that context. But I, for in terms of we've talked about this in other places with digital matters like in terms of thinking through your projects to be in that negative space of the trollers it's 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 i i want to i i i'm still tempted to only focus on the people who are trying to create social change and not the and not the um not the toxic fandom but i'm definitely gonna have to address that every time i give a talk about it everyone wants to talk about it so yeah Sarah, did you see Anna's comment? I like the subsequent campaign to release the Zemo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Once the trollers come, then there's there's other people that respond that say, well, no, we need another version of Ariel that's not just a white girl, right? Like, so there, it's a really interesting kind of give and take. I mean, part of, I guess, what I'm arguing is that there's more intersections than you would think between those two things too, I think. Okay, well, we are right up to the end of our time. So I wanted to take one more chance to thank everyone for coming today and especially to thank our presenters for sharing all of your important work. And yet, yeah, and I see a couple more comments coming. Thank you, Beth. Um, and everyone just stay safe out there. And I hope that we get to see some of you in the fall, at least socially distanced and with masks, but um, very excited to, to connect, especially with the people I never got to meet in person this semester. So thanks to everyone. Stay safe.